Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Ashraf Abulnaga, who's visiting here from University of Waterloo. Um, I think a lot of people here know Ashraf for a variety of reasons, and um, but he's done a, a pretty broad range of work in the database field, and in the last few years has kind of moved into new areas, focusing on cloud computing and and um, data integration of of, of web data, um, and in particular his work on um, on. Um, Part of the work he's going to describe here today on, on cloud computing was in a VLDB paper just a couple months ago that won Best Paper Award there, um, which, by the way, was incorrectly listed as VLDB 2012 in the, in the advertising that went around. It's, you know, maybe he'll have one there, too. Who knows? <laughs> we'll see. But um, anyway, without further ado, let me turn it over to Ashraf. Thank you, Phil. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming to my talk. So the title of my talk is uh, High Availability for Database Systems in Cloud Computing Environments. More generally, it's about providing a database service in the cloud. And before I start the technical material in my talk, let me start with some thanks that are due. This is joint work with my colleague, Professor Ken Salem, at uh, the University of Waterloo. And uh, the first part of the work is the work of my PhD student, Umar uh, Minhas who was an intern at Microsoft Research uh, a couple of times before. And he is graduating next year and needs a job. So if you guys have <laughs> jobs to offer, <laughs> Umar's your guy. Uh, the second part of the talk is the work of uh, Rui Liu, who was a postdoc jointly supervised by Ken and me. And he's also finishing in 2012 and also needs a job. <laughs> Uh, and the first part of the talk is collaboration with people at the University of British Columbia, Professor Andrew Warfield and his uh, graduate students. So as I said, this talk is about, or my interest in this area is about uh, using cloud technologies plus SQL database systems to build a scalable, highly available database service in the cloud. And another interest I have in this area of cloud computing is what if I don't care about a scalable, highly available database service? What if I have my own instance of a database system and I want to deploy it in the cloud. I want to run it on a virtual machine. How can we improve the way uh, database systems interact with these virtual machines? And also, how can we improve the underlying cloud technology? Can we add APIs? Can we add new f uh, features to the uh, cloud technologies to better support database systems? So why database systems? I mean, why am I focusing on this class of application? Well, they're important. Databases are important. And looking at the people in the crowd, I guess we all agree on that. This is not something I have to spend too much time convincing you guys of. Uh, but the, the question is, why do I think that we can solve this problem? Why do I think that focusing on database systems can get us somewhere? One reason is that database systems have a narrow interface to the user. They speak SQL. So when, I, when, I, when we need to reason about database systems, we don't need to reason about general programs in a language like Java or C-sharp, we need to reason about SQL. And secondly, database systems have transactions that offer very well-defined semantics for consistency and durability. Uh, and thirdly, database systems have these very well-defined structures, very well-defined uh, <coughs> operators. So regardless of your database system, you can always count on it having a buffer pool. You can always count on it executing queries as uh, trees of operators like hash join, uh, sort, merge join, and so on. And finally, database systems are very introspective. They have accurate performance models of their query execution costs. They have accurate performance models that tell you what the marginal benefit of uh, some extra memory will be. And if you can expose these m models to the underlying cloud technology, we might get some benefit from there. So for all of these reasons, I think it's promising to look at database systems as a specific class of applications and tune specifically for them. And in this talk, you'll see that I rely heavily on these two aspects. Well, I rely heavily on the, the semantics of transactions to decide when things have to be consistent and when they don't need to be consistent. And also I rely heavily on the fact that we have these well-defined structures and 
present optimizations that are tuned towards things like a buffer pool. So in my talk, I'll talk about two projects. The first is Remus DB, which is this VLDB paper that uh, Phil was talking about. And VRDMS DB aims to provide database high availability using virtualization. The second part of the talk, I'll talk about a new project called DBEX, which also aims to provide database high availability, but also scalability and elasticity by relying on eventually consistent cloud storage. So let's start with Remus DB and high availability using virtualization. So first of all, what do we mean by high availability in this context? What we mean is resilience to hardware failure. I know that when people talk about high availability, they talk about scheduled downtime and unscheduled downtime. Here we're focused more on the unscheduled downtime. We're talking focused on resilience to hardware failure. <coughs> and high availability is becoming an important requirement for all kinds of applications. It's not uh, high-end enterprise mission critical applications that have to be highly available these days. Everything has to be highly available. Every Facebook game has to be highly available. Nobody expects anything. Nobody is willing to accept anything less than 24-7 up, uh, uptime. And when we talk about high availability, we have to talk, we talk about several issues. So in the context of databases, we need to maintain database consistency in the face of failure. We need to minimize the impact on performance of the high availability solution, both during normal operation and also during failover. And finally, we have to reduce the complexity and administrative overhead of high availability. Now, high availability has been around for a while. There are many high availability solutions out there. And one common way to do high availability is to do active standby replication. So in this, uh, when, you, when you do active standby replication, you run two copies of your database one on a primary server and one on a backup server. And the primary is the active server. It accepts uh, user requests and performs queries. The backup is a standby server. And the primary ships uh, changes to the database from uh, to the backup by propagating the transaction log. And the backup is busy, is busy applying these changes so that when the primary fails, the backup can take over as the primary and it takes over with a consistent database state. So if, if solutions like this exist, why are we still working in this area? We're still working in this area because active standby replication is complex to implement in the database system and also complex to administer. You need to worry about things like how to propagate the transaction log in a transactionally consistent way. You need to worry about the atomicity of, of handover from primary to backup. You need to worry about redirecting client requests when the primary fails, the backup takes over as primary, the database is consistent, but you need to tell the clients that now instead of talking to this guy, they need to talk to this guy. And you need to minimize the impact on performance. So for example, when the failover happens, you want the failover to happen to a backup with a warmed up buffer pool. So it is, these solutions are complex. And what we're aiming to do in this work is to push this complexity out of the database system and into the virtualization layer. And uh, you know, if I want to invent a buzzword for this, I'd call it high availability as a service, in which we can make any database system uh, highly available by running it in our souped up virtual machine. And uh, we want to do this with as little performance overhead as possible. So the idea is still to use active standby replication. We still have a primary server and a backup server. But now the primary server is running a virtual machine and the database system is inside the virtual machine. And the changes, we, we still propagate changes from the primary to the backup, but we don't just propagate changes in the, in the database state. We propagate changes in the entire virtual machine state, which includes buffer pool, which includes a, a client connection state, so that uh, the, when the primary fails, the backup can take over as primary but now it takes over with a warmed up buffer pool and clients get filled over automatically to the backup. And this all happens with no code changes to the database system. Yes? So there's a performance penalty in running a database in a virtual machine. Yes. That, and that should be less than the performance penalty you get by the warm cold. Otherwise, there is a performance penalty for running a database in a virtual machine, but we didn't really uh, study that penalty in, the, in this work. We assume that you are willing to run your database system in a virtual machine. 
and you know there are people working on redu like the, this is a continuous process of there is a continuous process of reducing the penalty of running uh, database system in a virtual machine but this is part of the equation it is not part of the equation we focus on in this work what we focus on is making this virtual machine highly available yes so question on the client how do you implement the automatic failover of the client so we'll, we'll talk about that next okay. so remus db is built on Remus, which is a, a, a project that was developed at the University of British Columbia and is now part of the Zen hypervisor. And Remus does this picture. It, may, it, it maintains two copies of virtual machine, one on a primary server and on a backup server. And it periodically replicates the state changes from the primary uh, virtual machine to the backup virtual machine using whole machine checkpointing. And this whole machine checkpointing extends live virtual machine migration. So Things like uh, failing over the uh, clients from the primary to the backup are handled by live VM migration. Okay? And the, the transparency of failover is handled by live virtual VM migration. So Remus offers uh, transparent failover with only seconds of downtime. So Vivek, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, earlier we were talking about this backup being one down. What do you mean by the one? Is it all the pages in this cache and also in that cache? That in our case, this is what we will achieve. The two virtual machines will be exact replicas of each other. And that goes just for the backup pool or it goes for all it's the It's uh, the whole virtual machine state. Okay. So how does Remus do this whole machine checkpoint? How does Remus achieve high availability? So Remus divides time into epochs. Uh, the epoch length is a tunable parameter, but think of it as 25 milliseconds. So Remus lets the primary run un uninterrupted for 25 milliseconds. There is, there is no lockstep execution between primary and backup here. Uh, and at the end of this epoch, Remus performs a checkpoint in which it suspends the primary virtual machine, copies state changes from the primary virtual machine to domain zero. And for those of you who are not familiar with Zen terminology, domain zero is a privileged virtual machine that exists on any uh, um, physical machine running Zen, and it manages, it does, it's, it's the administrative domain. It's an administrative virtual machine. So you copy the st state changes to domain zero, and after this copy is done, the primary virtual machine can be resumed. And then asynchronously, DOM zero copies the checkpoint to the backup server, where the backup server applies it to its state. So, Here's an example of Remus checkpointing. This is an example showing three epochs, A, B, and C. And at the end of every epoch, uh, there is a checkpoint that's taken. In this example, the primary machine fails during epoch C. So when the primary machine fails, the backup takes over and it resumes executing execution from the latest checkpoint. So work that the primary did in uh, epoch C is lost. And it's okay to lose this work as long as you don't expose output to the user, because you don't want to expose unsafe output. So the way Remus handles that is that it buffers any output that is exposed to the user until the end of an epoch. So let's focus, for example, on network packets. Whenever the machine that's protected by Remus wants to send a network packet, that network packet is buffered until the checkpoint uh, at the end of the epoch happens and this, the state becomes safe. At that point, it's the packet is released to its user. On average, 12 and a half milliseconds. Yes. Yes, exactly. And that's actually part of the reason we, w we looked at Remus. Because Remus is there. You can run a database system inside Remus. But then if you look at what Remus does to database workloads, Without Remus protection, you have a database client, and you have a database server, and the client sends a query to the server, the query processes the, ser the, the server processes the query, and returns a response that is unprotected, and you have some response time. Now, if you enable Remus protection, taking checkpoints adds a certain overhead, and network buffering adds even more overhead. So you end up with uh, a protected uh, server but you get a much bigger response time. And the overhead of protection, we measured it to be up to 32% in some cases. So our goal in this work is to 
implement optimizations that are database inspired to reduce this overhead. And in the end, we're able to achieve less than 3% overhead and recovery within three seconds. So what I want to talk about now is the optimizations we do for Remus. Sam? What do you think a checkpoint? Do you wait until the backup applies them before proceeding? You wait until the backup acknowledges the receipt of the checkpoint. So as long as the checkpoint is here, you can proceed. Yes. Um, if you don't wait until the backup has been applied to the secondary, then um, there's a possibility that if both machines go down, you lose stack. Right? Yes, so here we're tolerating one failure. Okay. Is it extensible to one? It, uh, in theory, it is, but this is not something that either we or the original authors of Remus have, ex have actually uh, explored yet. So let me talk about the optimizations that we implement. So when we look at Remus and why it's slow for database workloads, we see that it's slow for two reasons. One is that database systems are heavy users of memory. So we implemented some optimizations that reduce the overhead of checkpointing virtual machines where the memory is being heavily used. And we, uh, we, I'm going to talk about two checkpoints, asynchronous checkpoint, uh, two optimizations, asynchronous checkpoint compression, and discrete tracking. Asynchronous checkpoint compression aims at sending less data during checkpoints, and discrete tracking aims at protecting less memory. Another reason why Remus is slow for database workloads is this 12 and a half millisecond delay that's added to every network packet. Some database workloads, in particular transactional workloads, where there's a lot of back and forth between the client and the server, are very sensitive to this network latency. So the the last optimization we implemented for Remus is to exploit the semantics of database transactions to avoid this overhead when we can. So let me talk about the memory optimizations first. So if you look at, if you look at uh, the way uh, database systems use memory, you'll see that there's, there are large sets of frequently changing pages of memory. One prime example of that is the buffer pool. But you can also think of the memory where the connection state with the clients is stored. And if you look at the way the database system uses this memory, in many cases, it's modifying a small portion of the page. So if you look at the buffer pool in particular, you're seeing that you see that the uh, database system will often write a few, will often modify a few uh, records on the buffer pool, in a buffer pool page. So there is a lot of memory that's being checkpointed, there is, which results in a lot of repl replication traffic between the primary and the backup. And there is redundancy in this, uh, in this replication traffic because you're modifying the same buffer pool pages over and over again, and the, every time there's a modification in a small part of this page. So when you looked at this, we said, well, instead of sending these redundant pages over and over again, send the deltas in the pages, and send them compressed. And the way we implement that is that we maintain a cache in domain zero that contains the most recently seen dirty pages we get from the protected virtual machine. So as part of checkpointing, the protected virtual machine sends the dirty pages to do domain zero. And domain zero looks in the cache. If these pages are found in the cache, then it does a delta between the original page and this page, compresses the deltas, and sends them over to the backup compressed. If the page is not found in the cache, it's sent uh, as a whole, not, not the delta, and this cache is maintained as an LRU cache. So the most recent pages are stuck in the cache, and the least recently used pages are kicked out. Ravi? Overhead of the CFA, you said, uh, are you running this every 25 milliseconds, right? Yes. So you do, you go to keep a cache for all pages, do the delta, and run... Computer. So what we do is we, in, in our implementation, we took 10% of the memory that's available for DOM0 and they devoted to this cache. But what is the overhead of running the delta? It should be a very small fraction of 25 milliseconds, otherwise... It, it, it is, yes. And, and one important thing to note about this delta, is about this compression, is that this compression is done asynchronously in domain 0. Okay, so it's asynchronous checkpoint compression. 
Okay, so there may be overhead for doing that, but it's overhead that's incurred by domain zero. It's not on, it's not on the critical path of the protected database system. But domain zero can spend the virtual machine until it sends out and gets an acknowledgement for the... No. No? No. No, it, it, it will, it will, as soon as soon as the pages are here, the, the virtual machine can, can continue. I see. I see. Network, uh, buffered network packets are not released until the checkpoint is sent to the backup, but the virtual, the, the protected virtual machine can continue executing. Okay. Now, uh, coming at this issue of overhead, in our implementation, whenever we could offload work from the protected VM to DOM0, we consider that as a win. So we're not too worried about DOM0 spending time asynchronously, compression, uh, spending time compressing these pages and sending them over to the backup, uh, because we assume that there is sufficient CPU capacity for DOM0. Vivek? This optimization, does it have anything to do with the buffer pool per se, or could this apply to any application? It's inspired by the buffer pool, but it's applicable to any database, uh, any, any workload where you have uh, a redundancy in the replication stream. So in, so in some respects, uh, what was the name of Remus? Remus, the, Remus running the, the, uh, the database, is that unchanged from Remus uh, running arbitrary applications? Yes. Yes. And I mean, so, if, so, even so these all the changes occur in domain zero. Is that what you're saying? Uh, in domain zero, and there's a little bit of change in in the virtual machine monitor, but the database system shouldn't be changed at all. And and the, and the VM that's running it isn't changed. It's not changed. Okay. So your domain zero became a. Well, like if you have, if you have it can, it can. That's not something we, we, we studied in this one. So, Ahmed? So the, the, the assumption that you have is that to begin with, there is no competition between the two, the two virtual machines, which means that you can count anything that this one does as a win for that one. Yes, yes. Does it hold, usually, in, in systems? If you have a system with a sufficient CPU, I mean, with, if you have enough CPUs, you can dedicate uh, CPUs to DOM0 and the assumption would hold. So, when you call, get data mm -hmm. from the uh, six virtual machine, uh, the virtual machine, do you need to do some synchronization? Say, some, uh, you need to get a, a snapshot, right, of, of data page, of virtual, virtual machine. Virtual memory operation. Mm -hmm. Do you need to domain zero operation? Do need, does it need to synchronize with? Yes. So, so while this snapshot's being taken, this virtual machine is suspended. That's the synchronization we do. And that's when when the check when the when the data is copied, the virtual machine can be resumed, and then the rest of the checkpointing can happen asynchronously. So, how long will it take to finish this? The, the, how long is the duration where the virtual machine is suspended? I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it's a, a small number of milliseconds. Okay. So the second optimization we implemented is, again, an, an optimization that's inspired by the buffer pool. So if you look at the way database systems read data from the database, you have an active virtual machine and a standby virtual machine, and both of them have their own disks, and there's a copy of the database on each disk. Now, when the, a database system loads a page from disk into its buffer pool, it looks clean to the database system, but it's dirty to Remus. So Remus will synchronize these dirty buffer pool pages to the backup with every checkpoint. And this read tracking says that it's based on the fact that synchronizing these clean buffer pool pages is not necessary because you can always read them, the backup can always read them from its copy of the database. So what we do in this optimization is we track for any disk read. Again, this is not specific to the buffer pool. It's inspired by the buffer pool. But what we do is for any disk read, we track the memory pages into which the read data is copied, the read data is copied, and we don't mark them as dirty. We don't send them in checkpoints. What we do is we send an annotation in the replication stream telling the backup you should read these pages from your copy of the data uh, database and put them in your, in, in your memory uh, to, to reconstruct these pages, okay? And the backup can do this read lazily, so uh, we only need to do this read from the disk when the, a failover happens, 
But in reality, what we do is we read these data uh, periodically so that we can make we can shorten fill, fill over time. Okay. So these are yes, Ahmed. So that particular one cannot be transparent, right? That particular optimization needs 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 the the, the protected virtual machine to be able to talk to Remus somehow to tell it to mark these. So the, the protected virtual machine does a read. And Remus figures out that the, the Remus gives the Zen gives the data back to the, that protected virtual machine, and at the same time Remus sends over to the other Remus on the backup virtual machine uh, an annotation saying you should read these disk pages and put them in your memory. How does it know that this is a database? database it doesn't. Page? It doesn't care. It's a it's a disk read that was read from disk and put in some page of memory. Oh, and there's some pocket. Okay. Okay. So the assumption that even even if no databases is run at all, the the, 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 the the virtual machine has an exact replica or the same copy of the data on database. Yes. Think of it, the data the on the primary disk. and the backup are replicas of each other, including the local disks. So are, they, so are these pages sent to domain zero, and then domain zero does the detection, or is there something else going on? Yes. Yes. That, that's the way Zen does reads. I mean, the, the, the domain zero is involved in the reads, and it detects, uh, it, it does this detection. Okay, so, so again, there's no ne the, it's not necessary for, so, so when, you, when you're doing a checkpointing at, at, the, at the 25 millisecond interval, and, and you're suspending the machine briefly and shipping over the stuff, how, do you, how in that process do you, do, you, do you distinguish the pages that have changed uh, via a disk read from those that have changed for updates, or don't you? Uh, you don't. I mean, so, so, Remus, so the way Remus originally worked was that it marked all pages as read-only, and the first time the protected virtual machine modifies a page, it raises a, a, an exception, and Remus would detect that, oh, this is really, a, this page now needs to be copied over. So what we do with this optimization is that if a page has been modified because data is being read into it from disk, we don't mark it as read only. We don't, uh, we basically just send an annotation that here's a, a new page that's been, re that's been read and the backup should read it from its copy of the disk. Okay, so I think I was misunderstanding something. So, 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 so you have uh, the database in, in a virtual machine <coughs> and then you gotta go through the checkpoint process. But the checkpoint process doesn't, isn't part of the virtual machine, it's, it's Part of the system underlying. Yes, it's 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 part of this. I keep going back to this drawing. Sorry. Yeah, it's part of this here. Yeah. Okay. It's part of the main zero and the hypervisor beneath. I promise never to go back to this machine. <laughs> this <part of> <laughs> <laughs> so now these two optimization that I described reduce the overhead of checkpointing memory and they are completely transparent to the database system. Now when you looked at network, we saw that there is an opportunity for optimizing uh, the way uh, Remus deals with network packets and we ended up with an optimization that's not transparent to the database system. So if you look at the way Remus handles network packets, Remus buffers every outgoing network packet which ensures that clients never see unsafe execution. But it adds up to three orders of magnitude to the latency of uh, every network packet. Because for Remus, we're assuming that the primary and the backup are in the same network. So uh, uh, 12, 12 and a half milliseconds of average latency is really high. And this is the largest source of overhead for many database workloads, and in particular transactional workloads. And our observation is that this is unnecessarily conservative for database systems, because database systems have their own transactions with clear consistency and durability semantics. So we don't need these uh, TCP level per checkpoint transactions that Remus adds. So what we did was we added to Remus an interface that allows a database system or any application to say that these packets need to be protected or buffered to the next checkpoint and these packets don't need to be protected. And the way this exposed application is via a Linux set sock opt option. So you have a socket and there's a toggle switch with, with every socket that says this socket is not protected, it's unprotected. And the way database system uses this uh, uh, switch is that 
It only protects transaction control packets. Begin transaction, commit, abort. These have to be protected. All other packets are sent unprotected, which means that the client sees unsafe uh, state. So if a client sees unsafe state, what happens when the primary fails? A failover, after failover, a, f uh, a failover handler runs in the backup virtual machine in a failover handler thread, and that failover handler, recovery handler or failover handler aborts all in-flight transactions where the connection to the client was not in protected state. So database systems are allowed to abort transactions. So for, to get a significant boost in overhead, uh, a significant boost in performance during normal operation, we pay this small cost of aborting extra transactions on failover. This is not transparent to the database system. We need to toggle this uh, socket between protected and unprotected state, and we need to do the abortion, the, the aborting in-flight transactions after failover. And we actually implemented this in both PostgreSQL and MySQL, and we ended up having to modify maybe 100 lines of code in each system. So let me show you how this works. So this is our experimental setup. It's exactly the picture I was showing. We have a primary server, a backup server connected via a high-speed network, and we're running MySQL and PostgreSQL. Sorry. Yes? Sorry. 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 Yes. So does, does, does this modification include the, 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 the failover handler that was needed? To the yes. yes, this 100 lines of code includes everything. So first of all, can we do failover? Here I'm showing you TPCC on MySQL, and on the x-axis I'm showing time, on the y-axis I'm showing throughput, transactions per minute C. And the green line is an unprotected virtual machine. In our setting, we can get a sustained throughput of around 400 transactions per minute. If we run unmodified Remus, we get this red line, so there's a significant performance overhead. If we run protected Remus, uh, sorry, if we run Modified Remus, Remus DB, we get this blue line. We significantly reduce overhead. Now, in this experiment, halfway through the experiment, we fail the primary server. We actually pull the plug on the primary server. And the unprotected virtual machine can't proceed beyond that. Throughput drops to zero. It's not available anymore. Both protected virtual machines proceed with very little downtime. And they actually achieve peak performance. Uh, they, they achieve the same performance as the unprotected virtual machine. Why does performance jump in this way? Because now the backup, backup has taken over as the primary, and it's not protected anymore. <coughs> so what we're, we're not advocating that you fail the, your, your machine to get better performance. What we're, see, what we're seeing here is that you, if you're not protected, you don't pay the cost of protection. So this is failover. Now let's look at overhead during normal operation. Uh, so this is TPCC on PostgreSQL. And here, if we run unmodified Remus, we see this 32% uh, 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 overhead. So our performance is 0.68 of unmodified, uh, of an unprotected virtual machine. If we use Remus DB's transparent memory optimizations, we recover most of that performance. But if we also use the uh, non-transparent commit protection, we get back to almost the same performance as an unprotected virtual machine. We get back to 97% of the performance of the unprotected virtual machine. Now the picture is a little bit different with TPCH. TPCH doesn't have this back and forth between client and server, so it doesn't benefit that much from commit protection. It doesn't benefit that much from, from the non-transparent network optimization. But we do get a significant performance boost using the uh, memory optimizations. So that's Remus DB. What we've achieved is high availability for any database system with no code changes or with very little code changes if we use these non-transparent optimizations. And we have now automatically and fully transparent, uh, automatic and fully transparent failover to a warmed up system. Now the next steps in this project are uh, we're looking at reprotecting a virtual machine after it fails. So we can tolerate one failure at a time, but we can, once we are in this state where the virtual machine is, is, is unprotected, we can quickly go back to a state where it is protected. And one of the nice things about Remus is that the backup doesn't have to do a lot of work in normal, during normal operation. It's just applying checkpoints. 
So one possibility we can explore is to have one server serve as the backup for multiple uh, primary clients. And finally, there are some administrative questions that arise when you protect the database system with RemitchDB. For example, how much network bandwidth do we need between the primary and the backup? And we're looking at answering some of these questions in our current work. So, Dave? So, so if you're, uh, say, a cloud service provider and you're, you're deploying the system um, in, in the cloud, you've got a bunch of servers and, and you're, you're trying to finally get as much out of your system as possible, you're going to end up being very concerned about the performance of domain zero. And, and, and so the question to be asked is, have you measured what the overhead is of, of, of domain zero? And, uh, no. No, I mean, in our experiments, we were running on the same physical, on, on a physical host, we were running one protected virtual machine and one domain zero. Mm -hmm. So the overhead that one protect, that one virtual machine places on domain zero is very low. Mm -hmm. The situation would be different if we had 10 virtual machines okay. on the physical server. And that's not something we ran the experiment. So it wouldn't have been meaningful for us to measure the CPU utilization, for example, of DOM zero because it would have been very low. Is, Phil? Is domain zero single-threaded? Uh, no, it's not. It's not. So, it could it, so on a multi-core system, it could potentially be running on two cores yes. currently. Yes. Yes. And actually, that's part of the configuration. So then it will scale up. It's even if, even regarding Dave's concern. I mean, even if it gets heavily loaded, I mean, over time you're going to see more cores. So that's cores are cheap. Yeah, so, so th this is all predicated on cores are cheap and plentiful. Uh, but I think some of the concerns that are raised, uh, were raised is that, well, if you're running in a cloud environment, you don't want to be wasting cores like this. And uh, if you want, I mean, we can't avoid the fact that we are saving time in the protected virtual machine by doing more work in domain zero. And uh, I'm not necessarily concerned about that. I'm just interested in, in, in what, what it is that you're paying so, yeah, so that I can you tell whether I should be concerned. I see. We, we didn't measure that because we're paying CPU cost in domain zero, okay. and cores are cheap and plentiful, so we're willing to pay CPU cost in domain zero. What about communication cost? So that was very low in our setting. That we did measure, and we reported that in the paper, and it was uh, quite low in our setting, especially with our optimizations that reduce corporate communication cost. Uh -huh. I think, um, I think added to that particular problem is, is basically the, uh, like I said, the assumption that there is no contention. And, um, well, if, if you have a virtual machine that runs one, uh, uh, that has only a, a machine that runs only one virtual machine that is dedicated, I might as well, I might as well just give it the core and mm -hmm. use another system that doesn't waste the core for doing zero um, and does database replication. I usually do it because I can run multiple systems on it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, the question that I had in my mind was, um, for one virtual machine, yes, you have some some extra uh, leverage to give some time to, to do the work in domain zero. Mm -hmm. But if you do that for five or six, you might actually have to uh, have to be paying a penalty per for each machine that is in aggregate more than that if you just left it alone. Um, left it alone unprotected, you mean? Yes. Not, or, or did it with some other technique for which it actually so, does so, so, so this is what we want to achieve. Protection with no code change in the database system. And what you're saying is that we pay a cost for that. And my answer is yes, we do. I mean, we, the cost we pay is that we need to provide processing capacity in domain zero. Now, can you do this by doing log shipping and, and the database system? Yes, you can. One last question. Yeah, so what is the behavior when the backup actually fails? Because when the primary fails, the backup becomes uh, primary and it's unprotected, so the port is uh, almost mm -hmm. the same as the, the unprotected yes. one. Yes. But once the backup fails, primary still has to send all those checkpoints. The primary will figure out that there's nobody receiving the checkpoints on the other side, so it will stop sending them. Okay. Okay, so it, it, it will behave in the same way as if the backup had failed, as if the primary had failed. So now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about another project, which is uh, about building a database service by running database systems on eventually consistent cloud storage. So, uh, uh, Phil, uh, should I, do I have to stop at 11.30 or can I go to 11.40? Okay. 
So I'll probably try to stop by 11.40 or thereabouts. And uh, you guys are already using your question time in the middle of my talk, so. <laughs> uh, so I'll probably stop at 11.40 and, and not have too much time for questions. So this work is still, uh, hasn't been published. And here we are relying on cloud storage. So what is this cloud storage? There's many systems these days that are developed for the cloud, things like Amazon S3, things like HBase, things like Cassandra. And these systems are all storage systems that are very scalable, distributed, fault tolerant, but they provide a very simple interface to the user. They're all key value stores, where the basic operations are write a row with a specific key or read the row with a specific key. And they provide atomicity only for single row operations. They don't provide multi-row atomic transactions, and they don't provide the richness of SQL, which is why they're called NoSQL systems. And in this uh, work, what we're saying is, if we have one of these scalable cloud storage systems that's running, hopefully, in multiple data centers to provide disaster tolerance, can we build a multi-tenant database service in this setting by running independent database systems on this cloud storage system. So here we're not interested in scaling an individual database tenant. We assume that one machine has sufficient CPU, has sufficient capacity for one tenant. But we're interested in scaling the storage capacity and bandwidth available for each tenant and in scaling the number of tenants. So we want to build a scalable, elastic, highly available multi-tenant database service that guarantees, that supports SQL and asset transactions. And the idea is that the cloud storage system will provide the scalability, elasticity, and availability, and these database tenants, the, the database systems will provide SQL and asset transactions. So we implemented a prototype of a system like this, and in our prototype, what we wanted to look at is if we are building this service on top of an eventually consistent storage system, can we take advantage of the relaxed consistency of the storage system to give us better uh, performance? So our prototype is called DBEX, which stands for Databases on Eventually Consistent Stores. And in our prototype, we use MySQL and its NODB storage engine. Actually, nothing in what we do is specific to MySQL, so we could have replaced MySQL with any other database system. but the storage uh, system that we use is Cassandra, and we do rely on Cassandra because we want eventual consistency. So I'll talk more about the system, but Vivek had a question? Yeah, I was trying to understand your multi-tenancy model. Mm -hmm. you could go back to the sickness. So when you say DBMS, so should I interpret that as one database server? This is one instance of MySQL with its own clients and its own databases, and it's independent of all the other instances of MySQL that's running. They're running on different machines? Different different, machines, different database. But they share the storage subsystem. They share the storage subsystem, but they each have their own storage blocks system. within the storage system. <coughs> so basically, what we want is to add more and more tenants, not to grow one tenant. OK? So why Cassandra? As I said, Cassandra uses eventual consistency. So by relaxing consistency, it reduces the latency of writes, and it enables, uh, and it, it's partition tolerant. It can run in multiple uh, data centers. So let me spend a few minutes talking about Cassandra. Cassandra stores data as semi-structured rows that are grouped into column families. So think of these column families as tables, and within a table or a column family, you have semi-structured rows. And these rows are accessed by a key, so every row has a key, and the rows are replicated and distributed by hashing these keys. One of the nice things about Cassandra is that it uses multi-master replication for each row. Many of these uh, cloud storage systems try to guarantee consistency, and they do that by having a single master. Cassandra doesn't do that. Cassandra has a multi-master for each row, which enables Cassandra to run in multiple data centers and gives us partition tolerance. And we'll rely on that for uh, disaster tolerance in uh, our system, in, in DBEX. Another nice thing about Cassandra is that 
a client controls the consistency of each write. So there is this consistency versus latency trade-off, and Cassandra allows the client to manage this with every read or write operation. So in Cassandra, a read or write operation specifies the consistency level. And the client can say, write one or read one, which means get me any copy of the data or write one copy of the data. And that's fast, but not necessarily consistent. There's also write all and read all, which means read all the copies of the data and get me the most recent, or write all copies of the data. And that's consistent, but maybe slow. So Cassandra allows a client to control this uh, latency versus consistency trade-off. And in this work, we posit that database systems can control this trade-off very well. So, so um, if you say write, you illustrate this with write all, read all. Can I do write all, read one? Yes, you can. Yes. So you can do quorums. Yes, yes. There is, uh, there is actually an explicit read quorum. So uh, uh, in my next slide, I'll talk, I'll talk more about these consistency levels. But now I want to give a broader overview of Cassandra. Now, another nice feature in Cassandra is that Cassandra uses timestamps with each uh, uh, write. And these timestamps are provided by the client. So the client controls the serialization order of updates. And this is important for us in our system. Cassandra is also scalable, elastic, and highly available, but so are many other storage systems. So we didn't choose Cassandra because it's scalable, elastic, and highly available. We chose Cassandra because of this. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, this consistency versus latency trade-off. So in Cassandra, there is uh, an operation. I mean, when you specify a read, you specify a consistency level. So the basic operation is to read the value of a specific column in a row with a specific key. So you give the column name, you give the key, and then you specify consistency level. You can say read one which means that Cassandra will send the read request to all replicas of this row, and it finds the replicas by hashing on the key, and it returns a value to the client as soon as one replica responds. So it's fast, but may return stale data. Now, there's also read all, where uh, Cassandra sends the read request to all replicas of the, day of the row, and it waits for all of them to respond and returns the latest copy. So this is consistent, but it's, it's as slow as the slowest replica. There's also write one versus write all. So you, uh, Cassandra sends the write request to all replicas, and it either acknowledges as soon as one replica responds, or as when all, it has to wait for all replicas to respond. And there's also other consistency levels. So there's read quorum. There's also data center aware consistency levels. So there's this trade-off. Now let's quantify the, the pen, this trade-off. So consistency is possible, but it's expensive. So how expensive? So to do that, we ran some experiments. And here we're running Cassandra in uh, the EC, Amazon's EC2 cloud. And we have a system with four Cassandra nodes. So a small Cassandra cluster. And we're running this benchmark called the Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark, which is uh, a very simple benchmark that does reads and writes. So no, no fancy SQL here. And here, I'm showing the latency of writes and reads. Blue is write all uh, and read all. Red is write one and read one. And here, all the four Cassandra nodes are in the same EC2 availability zone. Think of this as the same data center. So you see that there is a factor of two penalty between the read one and read all. But if we move two of the, EC, of the Cassandra nodes to two EC2 availability zones within the same geographic region, the penalty becomes bigger. And if we move the uh, two Cassandra nodes to a different geographic region in two different data centers, one on the US East Coast and one on the US West Coast, the penalty becomes huge. The difference in performance between the consistent read and write and the potentially inconsistent read and write becomes very big. So the message from these experiments is that there is a significant cost to be paid if we use read all and write all, especially if we want multi-data center operation. Four. All. So there is no quorum here? So, so it, doesn't, it doesn't do any, any, any try to say, well, if, if two or three agree that this is the latest one, it all means all of them? All means all. 
how, because you have to wait for everybody to respond to decide which is the latest one. But it doesn't manage. It, it, it doesn't manage its own consistency so that it, it relies on, on the majority being, being the majority tells you. You can say read quorum and write quorum if you want. But, it's, but still, your quorum here is, is the distributed among two data centers, so you, you still have to wait for somebody from the other center to, to respond. Okay, so this is an overview of Cassandra. So what did we want to do with Cassandra in this project? We want Cassandra to look like a disk to the database system. So a scalable, elastic, highly available, transcontinental disk. So what we're, what we're going to store in Cassandra is disk blocks. So Cassandra... Data ha Cassandra stores rows with keys and values. In our case, keys are uh, disk block IDs. And because we have different database tenants, we append the database system ID to that. Values are the contents of a disk block. And we don't do anything fancy with Cassandra's columns and column families. We just have one column family with one column containing all our data. And we have this layer this client library that intercepts read and write requests from the database system, in our case from MySQL's NODB storage engine, and it converts them to read and write requests in Cassandra. And the question here is, what consistency level should the Cassandra I.O. layer use? If it uses write one and read one, it's fast, but might return stale data and it provides no durability guarantees. And reading stale data makes database systems very unhappy. So this is not something that will work for a database system. Now, if we want, one way to get consistency is to use write all and read one, which is what, what Dave was, was uh, uh, mentioning. And that returns no stale data and guarantees durability, but writes are slow. So our goal in this project is to Try to achieve the performance of write one and read one while maintaining consistency, durability, and availability. And we do that by making two changes to uh, Cassandra and to the way we use Cassandra. The first is something we call optimistic I.O. in which we say, well, if write one and read one are cheap, let's just use write one and read one. And if we happen to get stale data, let's detect that and recover from it. The second change we made is what's something we call client-controlled synchronization. When we, when, we, when we use write one and read one, we lose durability. Client-controlled synchronization gives us back uh, durability. It makes database updates safe in the face of failures. So let me spend a few minutes talking about each of these optimizations. So optimistic I.O. A key observation we had here is that even if we use write one and read one, most of the time, Reads will not return stale data. Why is that? Are we just looking at the world with pink glasses? No. There, is reason, there are reasons for that. First of all, we have a single writer for each database block. We have many different database blocks that, that belong to many different database tenants, but we have a single writer for each database block. And secondly, because these writers, because these clients are database systems, they have a buffer pool. So when a database system writes a block, it's unlikely to immediately turn around and read the same block. It's gonna, it's, the, the block is in the buffer pool, so it will, it will like, well, there's likely going to be a period of time between the write and the next read of this block. And in that time, even if Cassandra uses write one, the uh, update would have propagated to all replicas. Because remember, with write one, Cassandra sends the, the write to all replicas. It just responds as soon as one of them acknowledges it. And finally, there is a factor that's not really important, but it's also part of the picture, which is that because of network topology, the first client, to, the first Cassandra node to acknowledge a write is likely to be the same one, that, is likely to be the same node to acknowledge a read. So because of all of these reasons, if we use write one and read one, most of the time we will not see stale data. But there is a likelihood of seeing stale data. So what should we do? Well, what we do is detect stale data and recover from it. So how do we detect stale data? There's this Cassandra I.O. layer in the client, and this Cassandra I.O. layer stores a version number with every block in Cassandra, and it remembers the most recent version number of every dat database block. And when we use read one, 
we check the version number that's, that's returned by the read one against the most recent version number. If it's the most recent, we're fine. Our optimism was uh, warranted. If we detect stale data, then we have to recover and retry the read. And when we retry the read, we can use read all so that we can be guaranteed to get the most recent uh, copy. And an interesting observation is that even if we retry the read using read one, we are likely to get the most recent copy. Why is that? Because when Cassandra detects staleness, it initiates a repair process whereby it brings all the replicas up to date. So if we retry the read one, we're likely to see that Cassandra has already repaired this, uh, this stale row. Now, remembering the version number of each block seems expensive. Do we really remember the version number of each block? The answer is no. What we do is we remember the version number, the most recent version number of only the most frequently or most recently uh, touched disk blocks. So our Cassandra IO layer considers a block to be in one of three states, either unknown, inconsistent, or consistent. Unknown means I don't know the, rec the most recent version number and I have no information about this block. This is the way all, this is, this is all the disk blocks when, when all the blocks when the database first starts. So what do I do if, my if I'm reading a block that's in the unknown state? I use read all. Once I read a block, I get the most recent version number. If, if once I do read all and get the most recent version number, I can store that. Okay? And if I write a block and I know the most recent version number of it, then I, then I, I know that this is, this is a block that might be inconsistent. So I can use read one for that block, but I compare, I have to compare the version number returned from Cassandra with the most recent version number which I know of. Now, we've also modified Cassandra so that whenever it responds with a version number, it gives us not just the newest version number, but also the oldest version number. And as we're interacting with Cassandra, we're, also, we're always comparing the newest and oldest version numbers of different disk blocks. And if the newest and oldest are the same, then we know that the block is consistent. What does consistent mean? It means I can use read one and I don't even need to check version numbers. And I maintain a bounded sized list of consistent blocks, a bounded sized list of inconsistent blocks. And if any of these lists uh, outgrows this bounded size, I just return the least recently used blocks to the inconsistent state, to the unknown state. I can always rely on read all if I don't know about this block, ab about the state of uh, a block. Dave? Something you can delegate to Cassandra. Uh, remembering the most, so how, how, would we, how would we delegate remembering the most recent version number to Cassandra? By having it, <coughs> having it, I mean, have to change Cassandra to do this, but you could have Cassandra do it. Well, alternatively, you could, you could pass the version number to Cassandra and say, I'll take, I'll take the block which matches this as soon as you find it. That, that's an interesting possibility. We haven't looked into that. So, so basically, one of the things about Cassandra is that the client might, might connect to different Cassandra nodes at different times. So if you pass the version number to Cassandra and tell it, give me the, the version number that's this or higher, we can do that. But right now what we're doing is, is keeping this outside of Cassandra. Because it depends upon which one you want to change versus which one you don't want to change. Yeah, yes, yes. And also any solution that we come up with has to uh, work under the assumption that the client will connect to different Cassandra nodes for different requests. So by maintaining the version list in our uh, client library, maybe we make this, maybe we avoid having pro problems that arise when you connect different nodes to different requests. Well, Cassandra could use the same strategy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, guess, I guess fundamentally there is no reason why this has to be in the client library, not in Cassandra. So, now we're, we're able to use read one and write one for most uh, of our requests, but we, our data is not safe. Write ones are not safe. And also, if I use read all, this will block if any replica is down. So how can we deal with failures? One naive solution would be to say, I'm going to use write all and read quorum. And if a node is down, the write will block. But what we did in our system is, again, observe that data, because database systems have their well-defined 
transaction semantics, they know precisely when data must be safe and when data can be unsafe. So for example, the write ahead logging tells us that you have to write a log record before you write the corresponding data page. You have to, you have to flush the log tail when you do commit. If you are reclaiming uh, records from the log, you have to write the corresponding data pages. There is a well-defined uh, set of points where data has to be made safe. And database systems are used to dealing with file systems that don't always guarantee safety. So they're used to saying f-sync or something like f-sync when they want data to be safe. So if we can add something like f-sync for Cassandra, then we can afford to keep data unsafe until f-sync is called. Well, what, happened when, what happens when a failure happens and we lose unsafe data? It's exactly what will happen if a database system loses unsafe data. You abort uh, transactions. Okay? So what we did was implemented a new type of writing Cassandra called write C-Sync. And C-Sync stands for Client Controlled Synchronization. This is a new consistency level for write sync Cassandra. And write C-Sync behaves like write one. So it acknowledges the client as soon as one copy of the data is written. But it keeps the key of this page on an in-memory list called the sync pending list. So these are blocks that need to be synchronized when the client issues a write sync. And we also added a new call uh, in the Cassandra client called csync, Cassandra sync. And whenever the database system says fsync, the Cassandra IO layer, which is the layer between the database system and Cassandra, uh, translates its fsync into a csync. Okay, so basically, we're making data safe only when the database system needs it to be safe. So data that's written remains unsafe until the database system explicitly requests for this data to be safe. And any period of time between the write and the csync is an opportunity for latency hiding. Cassandra can be propagating the uh, data while, and the client doesn't have to be waiting for it. What about reads? We use read quorum to deal with the possibility of one uh, of, of uh, uh, Cassandra nodes being down. And so the implementation of the C-Sync uh, call in the Cassandra layer, does that translate into write all for, for, into like for, right, for all of the, the pending ones, write, write them all? No, so C-Sync is something that has to be that, that needed extra implementation inside Cassandra. So basically, <coughs> when we write with this new C-Sync synchronization level, the, there's this, every Cassandra node accumulate, accumulates keys on this sync pending list. Right. And what, when we send a C-Sync call to the Cassandra node, what we're saying is, do a write all for every key on this sync pending list. That's just one thing. Okay, so, yeah. it, so inside that particular node? Inside Cassandra, it, yes, it, will, it becomes a write all. Well, they haven't been flushed yet, they haven't been synced yes, all, and yes. then issue. And there, there's more, so basically, we can make this C-Sync, instead of doing write all, do write to multiple data centers. So you don't have to write so, all so copies. The, so the read quorum actually can, can be, you're trying to say that the, it will be faster for the next read quorum, and we don't have to wait for all. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. The idea is that instead of saying write all, uh -huh. make sure that you write at least to do two disaster recovery uh, zones so that you are protected at least. And you can That's, yes. Uh, what I'm saying is we can do these kinds of things when we implement the C-Sync call. Okay. So I thought it write once actually wrote everything, but only uh, but act as soon as there was a, there was a uh, so anyone came back saying that it was. Yes. And so, so if you could track how many came back, you could, you could discharge your, your C-Sync list sort of as things go on and not have to do another write all, right? Um, yes. Uh, um, there is the opportunity to uh, clean the C-Sync the sync pending list yeah. without waiting for a C-Sync. I'm not sure if I actually do that or not in our current implementation. Because that would, that would, I mean, it's, that's like, that's like, yeah. Um, was it? I'm, I'm having a, a brick parry moment here. Uh, uh, go on. 
So one of the goals we set, uh, uh, one of the goals we, we uh, wanted to achieve when we started was to deal with failures. So what are examples of, of failures we can deal with? So what happens when we lose a Cassandra node? If we lose a Cassandra node, that's completely transparent to the database system. It's handled by Cassandra. Cassandra detects when the, load, when the node is down and it takes it off the replication ring. And when the node is back, comes back up, it catches it up with all the data in it. So that's one advantage of using a system like Cassandra. What about if we lose the primary data center? Here we don't have a fully uh, a good story, but we have at least a partial story. So here, if we are running Cassandra in multiple data centers and we have the data stored in multiple data centers, which we can do with our existing implementation, we can restart the database system in a backup data center. So we don't have an always on database system, but we can restart the database system in the backup data center and apply the standard log-based recovery to bring the database up to uh, date. We can count on a transactionally consistent view of the log being there in the backup data center because of the way we did uh, writes, optimistic I.O., and because of C-Sync. So let's see how this works. So here, I'll show you results of, uh, yes? So are you using Cassandra for the log also? Yes, yes. So, so, so if you're only doing the right once, you wouldn't necessarily, until you did a, a sync, know that your log was at the disaster center, right? That's, that is true, yes. So you could, you, you're risking losing some of the end of the log in this. If the database system doesn't do an F-sync. So we're risking losing the end of the log whenever the database system would have been willing to risk losing the end of the log. Whenever a database system says, I, w I want to make this data safe by issuing an F-sync, we make the data safe in Cassandra. So three or four experiments and then we'll wrap up. Uh, here, we're running TPCC on MySQL in Cassandra in Amazon EC2. We have a small Cassandra cluster with six nodes. And I'm showing results for three situations. The first is when I have all six Cassandra nodes in one EC2 availability zone. And the yellow bar shows the baseline, which is write all, read one. Uh, the blue bar says, uh, shows what we can achieve with optimistic I.O. So you can see that you can get a significant performance boost with optimistic I.O. But optimistic I.O. is not safe. Now, if we bring back safety by uh, using C-Sync, we pay a little bit of performance penalty, but this performance penalty is not that high. Now, the difference between the yellow bar and the red bar becomes bigger if, we, if the, our six Cassandra nodes are divided among two availability zones in the same geographic region. And it becomes even bigger when we are, doing, uh, when we are replicating in two geographic regions, US East and US West. So basically, one way to look at this work is that we're enabling you to run MySQL on Cassandra and get the red performance instead of the yellow performance if you're running in, in two regions. Phil? Doesn't the performance of the C-Sync bar depend on how frequently you do C-Sync? Yes. This is... And so how frequently on this graph? Uh, this is not something we measure. So we have a, we have a, a TPCC... So we do, we do C-Sync whenever MySQL does F-Sync. How frequently does MySQL do F-Sync? Um, it does F-Sync whenever, it, do, it does F-Sync with every commit, it does F-Sync... Uh, every commit? It does F-Sync whenever it needs to make the data safe. Well, that's normally at every commit, isn't it? Yes, yes. So definitely at every commit, but I think there's also other situations. So, when, when, for example, whenever it's reclaiming a page in the buffer pool, it needs to F-Sync the log tail before it reclaims the page in the buffer pool. I mean, there the, the are points where, where data must be made safe, and the only way that NODV knows how to make a database safe is to do f -sync. You have this worried look on your face, and I'm not sure why you're worried about it. I'm just surprised, because that's very, fre that's very frequent handshaking across the wire. Um, I mean, are, I mean, answer, I mean, Dave's scenario before, I mean, basically you're saying at every, at every transaction commit, you're going to make sure that all of, you're, you're, going to, you're going to eagerly push all the data out to the replicas. Yes. Right. I, I think one thing that may be useful, so that, I don't know if you, you probably don't have it in this graph, 
How does this compare against the local disk? What would be the TPM for the local disk? Uh, actually, we, ha we, we measured that, and one of the problems we're seeing now is that, is that there is a significant overhead compared to local disk. Because, because every I.O. on to local disk is translated into multiple I.O.s, etc. Yeah. So, so, my guess is uh, some of those concerns could be alleviated a bit by noting that if you do root commit, which almost everybody does, yes. and if it's a f-sync to the log versus an f-sync to the, to the database disks, and you would separate out those overheads also. Yes, yes. So, so basically the way Cassandra, I mean, as far as I know, the way InnoDB use f-sync is that whenever there is a commit, you f-sync the log. And if this if, if, if this f-sync catches a number of commits, you've avoided some f-syncs, and you only f-sync the data when you're doing a hard checkpoint. But I'd have to go back and, and, and look. Actually, your question addressed the point we didn't really investigate that much, which is how frequently does InnoDB do f-syncs? But it only acknowledges a commit to the client after an F-sync. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. I think that when you do a write, the, uh, you, ha you will propagate all the write to all the nodes. That's the C-sync just uh, to ensure that this has been done, right? The C-sync propagates all the writes, to the uh, write to all the nodes, yes. But that's only done when the database system requests. Yes. Uh, when you uh, issue a, uh, a write sync, a, a write C-sync, I mean, the, this thread will be propagated to the other nodes, right? At yes. the time. So the C sync just ensure that at the point that you're tracking, all these nodes has been updated, yes. uh, has been synchronized. Yes. So that's maybe the reason why you frequently uh, call the uh, C sync still the performance these nodes. Because the sync is going on all the time. Just when you call the uh, C sync, you track whether the sync has been done. Well, but that's not what he said last time. He said he wasn't sure whether the code was actually checking to see whether the stuff was done. It was actually yeah. pushing yeah. it yeah. out. Because I think that when you issue a write, you know, all the writes to the to all the nodes. So yeah. imagine, imagine the implementation underneath it. It, 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 it might, might be that the actual implementation didn't make sure that to, to flush the sync list, but the write all request would, from the Cassandra layer would return, I would assume, much faster if the sync has already been happening. One would hope. So let me move on. I want to show you. So basically, the message of this graph is you get to use MySQL on top of Cassandra with the red performance instead of the yellow performance. Now, let's look at the goals we set out to achieve, which are scalability and availability. So do we get scalability? So here, we have a, uh, we are adding more and more database uh, tenants. They're all running TPCC. They're independent database systems. They're running independent copies of TPCC. And we're proportionately increasing the number of Cassandra nodes. So we start with, uh, we have uh, two tenants on one database system and three Cassandra nodes. Then we go to six tenants on nine Cassandra nodes and so on. We proportionately increase the number of tenants and the number of Cassandra nodes. And what we get is a linear scale up in the total uh, TPMC that we see across all of these tenants. So we can scale in the number of tenants. Now, let's look at some availability results. Here, we are running our uh, TPCC, uh, our MySQL uh, in a data center that we call the primary data center. And then there are uh, three Cassandra nodes in this primary center and three Cassandra nodes in a secondary data center. And we fail one Cassandra node in the primary center at 300 seconds. And when we do that, there is a drop in performance until the other Cassandra nodes realize that this node has failed and stop sending requests to it. And then we recover our performance. Now, this node comes back, this Cassandra node comes back up at 900 seconds, and it takes a while to catch up this node with the other Cassandra nodes. So performance gradually rises until we get to the original performance. Yes? So you, you say that you, so for every tenant, you add one node? Uh, no. No, it's, I mean, it, we, we, we saw how in our setting how much uh, capacity we, we can, uh, how much load can a node sustain. And it turns out that for um, every one of the virtual machines we are using can sustain two, my, two instances of MySQL. And these two instances of MySQL need three Cassandra nodes to stay. So, but, but that is not, so, so what you're saying is that I add scalability by adding more nodes. That yes. is, 
But that, that, that's, that's the definition of scalability. There's, there's, there's no magic. You, if, if your system is overloaded, you are the only. So what I can tell you is that every one of these points represents a highly loaded system. So here it's a highly loaded system with a number of with some number of nodes, and here it's a highly loaded system with many more nodes. So the idea is that this is not it's not doing like this. It's basically linear. it's the idea is that this is linear, linear scale. It, it's not doing like this. Oh, sorry. Yes. Dave. Yeah. So so you can you can imagine running TPC in a couple of different ways. One is each of your each of your uh, uh, of your systems runs the TPC benchmark, and so every time you add a node, you're running, adding another one which runs the TPC benchmark. Yes. Is that what you did? Yes. So, so, what you do, what, so that's, if you will, perfectly partitionable because those are all partitions. Yes. Okay. yes. So, so what you're not showing is scalability where you just sort of stretch out the size of the, of the cluster machines that's running a single instance of TPC. Uh, so this, so so your scalability is like we we add independent clients doing independent things, and this is what we get. Right? Yes. So, so basically, the the storage system is able to support more and more independent clients. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So availability. I showed you what happens when a Cassandra node in the primary data center fails. This is what happens when a Cassandra node in the secondary data center fails. You don't see as much of a performance hit because. The secondary, the, the node in the secondary center is not on the critical path most of the time. Now, here's what happens when we completely lose the primary data center. And here, the story is not as nice. It's still OK. So what happens is that you have some performance, and then at 300 seconds, we completely fail the primary data center. Now, what happens is that we start a new database instance in the secondary data center, and this instance does traditional log-based recovery. It the log is there in Cassandra. It's transactionally consistent. After it's done with its recovery, it uh, comes back up and starts executing queries. And the reason why the performance after recovery is lower than the performance before recovery is that here it's US Coast East, here it's US Coast West, and East is closer to Waterloo than West. But actually, east is closer to the primary uh, 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 the database instance than west. I don't understand okay. why you need to do a database recovery. The database is, is part of your uh, data center? Yes. So we lost the database the data center with Cassandra and with uh, the database system. So if you have a standby database that is actually running, you can reduce that time? We can, but we don't, uh, right now we don't have standby database systems. And standby database systems would open up an interest, a whole bunch of interesting uh, issues. If you want to do standby replication, completely ignoring the fact that you have a shared storage, then you can do that without any problems. But what would be interesting is to see if we can exploit the fact that you have shared storage to make the standby faster. So what do we have so far? We have scalability and elasticity in storage capacity and storage bandwidth. We have scalability in the number of tenants. And we have a highly available and disaster tolerant storage tier. We have SQL and asset transactions for the tenants. So there's this question about whether we can scale consistency. Can consistency scale? And what we have now is, in my view, an interesting point in the spectrum of possible answers to this question. Now, what is it that we don't have? We don't have what Dave was talking about, scaling an individual database system. That's not something we have looked at yet. And we don't have always on tenants. So when our tenant fails, we have the advantage that when we restart the tenant in another data center, that new restarted tenant can find a copy of the database in the log and do log-based recovery. But we still have to incur downtime. We don't have this uh, automatic and transparent failover. So uh, let me conclude, and I can take any other questions offline. So in this talk, what I uh, argued was that high availability and also scalability for database systems can be provided by the cloud infrastructure. And this is not something that's new. Many people are working on different projects that aim to achieve this goal. But what I tried to uh, look at in this talk is to say that 
If we take advantage of the well-known characteristics and semantics of database systems, we can greatly improve uh, our solutions. And I presented two examples of this. One is RemusDB, which is high availability in the virtualization layer, and the other is DBEX, which is scalability and high availability by running on eventually consistent cloud store. Thank you, and sorry for running over time. <laughs>